Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today on the show, we have Elise Colleen, GP at Bitcoin VC firm, Stillmark. A Bitcoin veteran and investor in numerous Bitcoin-only companies, Elise dives into the current market outlook, how Bitcoin founders are handling the downturn, and how VC firms invest in the mining industry. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. As a premier training and education program for professional mining technicians, Foundry Academy answers. From hands-on ASIC labs taught by industry veteran instructors to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact, Foundry Academy graduates acquire the skills facilities need to be off and mining. They've even built OSHA 10 certification into the curriculum. Open to all who hold a high school degree or equivalent, the next one-week course taking place in Rochester, New York, runs September 12th through the 17th. Visit foundryacademy.com to register or reach out to academy at foundrydigital.com. Elise, welcome to the Compass Podcast. I really appreciate your time. And I've been looking forward to this one for a while. Uh, I've just been following you, I think, for three, four plus years uh, at the very least. I uh, love to see also Bitcoin venture capitalists out there in a sea of like DeFi trash, altcoin trash. There are venture capitalists who are actually doing the good work. So uh, again, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. We're definitely doing something different. And um, I've been looking forward to speaking to you as well. Yeah, let's start off with a general recap of the market. I don't think we can get away from this conversation. Like, it's just everyone wants to talk about the markets. Everyone wants to know what's going on. Everyone's concerned not only about their own paycheck, but they're also worried about where the the macro conversation goes from here. The Fed has been very aggressive in in increasing interest rates. We've seen a lot of firms blow up, whether that's Celsius, uh, BlockFi looks like it's going going to get a bailout now from uh, FTX. We saw three hours capital lately also explode. People are looking at all this contagion in the altcoin world. And I just want to kick it over to you. So far, it seems like it's really bleeding into Bitcoin markets. But a lot of Bitcoiners, I don't think they're upset or frustrated. Maybe they are. But I mean, this is expected, right? Bitcoin does this. It's very cyclical. It goes up really high. Hopefully, you're careful with your money. And then it goes back down. And then you're still fiddling. So what's your take on, on all the markets right now? And then move, we'll move into a conversation about Bitcoin entrepreneurship from there. Well, there's two things happening right now. First is that, of course, the macro environment is um, you know, in trouble. And it looks like we may see a sustained recession or a recession. And if that's the case, we know that BTC has traded historically as a risk on asset. It's traded like a tech stock. And so if tech stocks are down or if the macro environment is pulling tech stocks down, then BTC is likely also to be um, pricing down in terms of the exchange rate to USD. Um, we saw that during the, re- the short recession or the sor- short macro pullback that was catalyzed by COVID in 2020. And we're seeing that again now. And I think, of course, we all expect that eventually Bitcoin will trade as a risk off asset and we'll start start to separate from tech stocks. We're not at that point yet. And so we see that in the market today. The second thing that's happening is exactly what you noted, which is that Bitcoin, of course, is cyclical. The cycles are driven by having the reduction of the supply. The new supply introduced by miners reduces by half every approximately four years. And that catalyzes a bull and then bear market. And so we're entering in or we're in the bear market now. So we have both macro conditions pulling on the price of BTC, as well as we're in the part of the cycle where um, BTC trades down against USD. Now, the, the interesting piece is the challenge that that presents to founders building in the space. What it means for folks that have newly entered the space and their experience with being Bitcoiners and and then looking forward to the future, the opportunities that we have to be heads down and build and what we can expect to see in the next bull market when we get a, you know, a new 10x influx of Bitcoin holders. You're bringing up a, a few good points. I want to grab one of them to start and then I have a follow-up question. This last bull market is really interesting, right? So we had May 2020, the last halvening, a lot of people... Uh, they'll, they'll agree with that thesis that halvings uh, cause bull markets to occur. Uh, and the timing for this one definitely looked very good, right? It took about six months or so before we saw Bitcoin bull market start in December of 
2020. Uh, but this bull market was also quite sustained compared to the last one, right? So last time around 2017, 2018, Bitcoin only hovered around $10,000 or above $10,000 for maybe a few weeks. It was like eight weeks plus uh, and it clipped 20K for a brief second, right? This time around, like we had sustained levels above 30K for quite a while. And then even above 50K, there was weeks where we were above 50K for even longer. What led to those conditions that the bull market was so sustained for so long with such high prices? Uh, was it because of the halvening uh, in May 2020 or is it because the macro conditions are different? And you said that that risk off asset play was really the move for a lot of assets during that time. I think there was a few things happening. Of course, macro conditions have been a bit odd for a while now following um, the pandemic and the activities taken by the government to sort of try to stay off um, a downturn. And it's hard to disentangle that from what happened with Bitcoin and other risk on assets. Now, um, now there's two things that have changed as Bitcoin matures. And we I think we see the impact of that in this last cycle. One, of course, is that as adoption grows, we should expect to see volatility begin to be mitigated. And um, perhaps each part of the cycle or, or the bull market will be longer sustained as there's more holders. Um, and historically, of course, as adoption grows, the price of Bitcoin also um, it rises. Now, the other thing that happened in the pa- over the past few years is that popular on and off ramps were introduced. So more familiar on and off ramps. And so people had easier access to Bitcoin and um, in a, a sort of less frictionful experience in how to interact with Bitcoin and how to store it. And I think one of the repercussions of that may have been this sort of prolonged peak of the bull market. Um, as we move forward through future cycles, of course, we'll be able to better evaluate what's happened in the past and um, you know discern similarities in the variables that was driving that. But what I'm what I'm bullish about in terms of what we'll experience in the next cycle is really the impact that adoption has on price, on the uh, how it impacts volatility, and then how the integration of Bitcoin and Lightning into more familiar forms of tech. Um, will will affect who holds Bitcoin and how. Interesting. So I'm going to follow up with a, another question about this cycle theory. And then I think we should definitely move into uh, the entrepreneurship conversation as well. I've seen this float around Twitter quite a bit and want to get your take on it. This is the first down cycle where Bitcoin has been trading in a bear market during a recession, right? You right. noted that at the very beginning of the conversation. What does that do in terms of this halvening uh, thesis that a lot of portfolios hold to and a lot of Bitcoiners hold to? Do you expect that to break going into the next two years? And if so, how should entrepreneurs and anyone else in Bitcoin, even miners, uh, prepare for that breakage? I think it's hard to know. So here's the thing about folks that have been operating in this in the Bitcoin space for a while is that you learn to not um, project with any sort of certainty what's going to happen in the in the near term and the near ter- or even the short term. So meaning the next year, the next eighteen months, you want to make sure that instead of um, expecting um, sort of like placing bets on where you feel you know Bitcoin will go, you're scenario planning. So that you're doing, you know, a base case, um, a base case plus 20 percent, um, an optimal case, which maybe is base case plus, you know, 50 percent or more. But you're also doing the downside planning, um, especially if your business is directly impacted by Bitcoin's volatility. We just we don't know. We're sort of learning as we go. There's a lot of folks that, um, you know, project and try to predict the price. And some of those folks are very accurate. That's not our work, though. So on the venture capital side and for founders, I think the work is really about helping create the most robust company so that the company can survive and thrive regardless of the market conditions. And by the way, that's also how we measure companies' performance. So we understand that even without direct exposure to um, Bitcoin's volatility, company performance growth, for example, can be impacted by the conditions of the crypto or Bitcoin market. 
And what we want to see is companies aiming to exceed the growth or the state of the Bitcoin market. And so what that means is that in a bull market, you can be performing well, but really that's just sort of riding the coattails of Bitcoin. You want to be outperforming that. That's your goal. Um, in a bear market, you're, it's likely that the um, growth weight will decline, but you still want to be outperforming the market. And so there's this sort of layer of complexity in the Bitcoin space, which is that to evaluate your own performance, your KPIs, you have to try to uh, pull out the um, the noise of the Bitcoin, of Bitcoin's volatility, and just really take a realistic um, and holistic view of your metrics without that variable as being um, the most important. Yeah, I like this conversation because I think for mining specifically, it can be very easy to get trapped into that bull and bust cycle where last year miners did better than ever. You could pay off an ASIC in like six months if you had it on at the right time and had the right power. And then we go into a bear market and it's like, oh, that is extending to 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, even longer in some cases, depending on what kind of ASIC you have. And so you do have to have uh, a, an understanding of where the market is at and then produce some sort of KPIs that keep you above water and are manageable, but are going to beat the market. I'm curious for your portfolio companies that you manage, what in a generalistic sense are some of the baseline, um, say like pulse checks or, or something like that, that you do for your, for your companies? Do you pull it from like Bitcoin itself? Like, do you look at some sort of like Bitcoin metrics and be like, you guys should be beating these metrics or these valuations? I'm just curious to get your KPI information. Of course. So the first most important thing is that when we're investing to partner with a company, that we're in no way sort of um, taking over the helm. So we're not there to sort of govern or direct or um, you know tell a founder how to make decisions or set their KPIs. We're really there to be a, a collaborator and um, a data resource almost. So the difference between what we do and what founders do, of course, there's many, but one of the key differences is that a founder has really a portfolio of one. So they're building this one company, their heads down, they're an absolute expert on their fields, their operations, their team in a way that their investors will never be. But on the flip side, we have the advantage of working with many, many companies. So I've been in venture for um, a little over a decade. I, you know, I've worked with thousands of companies and hundreds of companies closely. And so some of those learnings um, will be relevant to, or some of those lessons, things that have happened will be relevant to companies that we're working with currently. And so our job is to try to extrapolate from what we've seen in the past to provide data that could be valuable for current portfolio companies. So we're not at the helm. We're sort of there as, um, you know, like a, you know, anything from an advisor to a friendly ear to a mentor, depending on what is best for the founder, what the founder deems best at that time. The first thing that most founders are thinking about in terms of core KPIs right now is just runway. So the first thing you want to do when you're when you expect to be entering a time where access to capital is uncertain is to understand how to get independent or how how long you have to be independent. But the great thing of course about Bitcoin founders and also just people operating in the Bitcoin innovation ecosystem is that because we trade because BTC has traded as a risk on asset and because the Bitcoin market is cyclical. We have a lot of experience in down markets. And, you know, for whatever reason, whether it be sensical or not, logical or not, I think it's illogical. But generalist VCs, historically, their appetite to back Bitcoin companies um, has been, you know, greatly influenced by the volatility of BTC. So in a bull market, there's venture capital dollars there. In a bear market, even for companies with no direct um, you know, a relationship with the Bitcoin price, in a bear market, there's still less access to capital. Founders have always had to plan for that. Operators have always been um, an audience to that, right? Um, an audience with a, you know, significant exposure to the way venture capitalists um, change in terms of their preferences. Um, so here's the thing. Founders are prepared. 
in the Bitcoin space in a way that's unique and supersedes what we see in traditional tech. Uh, what we see in the Bitcoin world is that in a bull market, founders raise and they think about preserving one way to last them through the full cycle. Um, we know that founders are prepared for a variety of scenarios, including to go to war at any time. And that's because they've had the experience of prior having to go through market downturns that affected their access to capital. And so I think this is an example of where the honey badger mascot really applies. Um, founders in Bitcoin and Lightning stay prepared. Um, so we have an advantage there. Now, in terms of looking at other metrics that companies should be tracking, that's really dependent on a company's specific strategy. So you gave the example of miners. In a down market or at any time, really, some miner, some companies focused on mining, might their, maybe their core metric is market share. And at other times, it might be um, building ARR for instance, or extending runway even, to give an example that I referenced just a moment ago. And so metrics are really going to be defined on what the, should be defined on what the company's longer term strategy is to build their enterprise value and what the next two years or, or longer means to that strategy. And so uh, for an example, if building market share is most important for a company's um, longer term enterprise value, then companies should be heads down on that in the bear market and taking advantage of the opportunities that will be there as others start to slow down growth um, or, or, or you know, sort of slow down their deployment of resources. Does that make sense, Will? Yeah, was, was stay on the bear market train. I actually want to see if I can get some info from you about like what is going through the mind of founders right now with with this recent pullback, uh, you mentioned like the um, time preference of founders or they're thinking in years, uh, they're not thinking about in just quarters, right? And so a lot of times these founders are prepared for it. It's very different in Bitcoin versus other um, assets, particularly you know, DeFi or something like that, where it, that is uh, thinking about the next quarter, maybe even the next week. Um, but Bitcoin founders seem to have like a longer time horizon when they're thinking about their companies. At the same time, though, it's it's pretty stressful to see Bitcoin collapse. It was like almost eighty percent. I think it was seventy nine percent from November until May. That has to put a lot of hurt on founders who are trying to build these new applications. So, uh, be curious to get your thoughts on your founders, uh, maybe in your portfolio company or from yourself or others that you've seen. Like, how are they handling this recent downturn? Well, for you know, to be fair to founders, there's a breadth of um, reaction, and so of course, you know, the industry we're not a monolith, and there's you know, sort of a lot that people are thinking and a lot of diversity there. But it's important to note that a lot of these folks, many, many, have gone through this before, and so they've sort of been there and done that, including myself. I've been here since 2013, and so it um, there's benefits. To a bear market. And we all appreciate that. And especially because the bull markets get really noisy. Um, they get really noisy in the altcoin space and whatever is the trend of that market cycle in the altcoin space. So this time it was DeFi. We're seeing that explode now or unwind. Um, it was DAOs, right? It was NFTs. And in the prior bull market, so in 2017 or 2018, whenever it was, we were talking a lot about ICOs. We're not talking about that anymore. Um, so anyhow, I think that there's an advantage to having a quieter space to build in. And in a bull market, um, exchanges have been the best sort of... Uh, people running exchanges have really well described this. But in a bull market, for a lot of companies, it's just about keeping up with growth versus actually being having time to be thoughtful to how you build, how you um, you know roll out product, and also how you're responsive to feedback from the adoption of your product or of infrastructure. And so what will happen in the bear market is that companies will have more time to focus on that. And I think we will see just incredible benefit from it. So maybe to veer off topic for a second to talk about the feedback loop between adoption and infrastructure and how powerful that can be in our field. We saw right ahead of the Bitcoin 2022 conference this year, the announcement of Tarot by Lightning Labs. And so what Tarot is, is it's a new protocol that 
will allow assets to be exchanged on Lightning Network ultimately later this year. Um, now, Taro is really based on feedback from the adoption of Lightning Network in emerging markets, right? And so what happened was we saw in 2021 this inflection point reached by Lightning Network where we understood the form, the early form that adoption would take at scale. And the way that people in emerging markets who didn't have access to the global economy otherwise, how they would use Lightning Network. And also we saw that Lightning Network could scale, right? Including for critical use where people are using Lightning to go to the pharmacy, to um, take their family out to dinner, to go grocery shopping, to do simple stuff. Um, But then the feedback that was received from that was that, you know what, if I make $400 a month, And if my family's bills are between $390 and $410 a month, I can't tolerate Bitcoin's volatility. I can't do that in a safe way for my family. Not until the world is denominated in Bitcoin, right? And so from there, um, Lightning Labs took in that information and the innovation that Lalu introduced is Taro, which will allow just those sorts of families that I described to get use of Lightning Network, so to stay unbanked, right? To be banked by Lightning um, and to be able to do that with digital dollars so that they can safely um, provide for their family so that $400 a month can actually cover their needs. And so while that was done um, in more bull market conditions, and of course, Lalu is... um, you know, one of a kind and really incredible in terms of what he's capable of um, in innovating during, you know, a a stressful or demanding time. I think that there can be, um, you know, that sort of innovation based off of feedback that we got from the bull market that can really progress the Bitcoin space um, and Lightning Network both. Let's turn towards uh, investing during the the bear market since you've brought it up a, a few times. How do portfolio companies look at this time? I'm assuming from what you've said previously that things have obviously slowed down a lot, but you also have that long time horizon. So you've probably put some money aside to be able to invest in new protocols that are coming up or new projects that are coming up. Um, I am just looking from a mining perspective and we just had a podcast with Galaxy Digital talking about the the loaning market or the loan market for mining right now. And it is just atrocious, right? You can't get equity deals right now. You can't do uh, ASIC back loans anymore, really, uh, just because ASIC prices are plummeting. Really, the only thing on the table is debt financing. And you're talking between 12% interest rates on the low side, right? And that's pretty tough to swallow, especially if you need capital now. Uh, you might have to do it. It's pretty tough to swallow because that capital is going to have to be paid off at some point. Uh, but for Bitcoin portfolios in general, is a situation different? And do these firms often need capital right now or are they sitting pretty happy after this whole market cycle. Of course, I'm sort of asking about your playbook and um, maybe if you have more thoughts about the general ecosystem, that would also work. So here's the thing. The illiquid nature of venture capital, traditional venture capital, where you're buying equity in a company, the illiquid nature of that is a feature. It's not a bug. And so the benefit of Bitcoin companies is that they've been capitalized through the sale of equity. And so that will smooth out the troughs. And of course, on the flip side in the altcoin space, if you're raising money through the sale of tokens and you're paying your developers or incentivizing your community through the existence of these tokens, then you're in a constant state of liquidity and the macro environment as well as the state of the crypto market will have influence on the value of your company and also the state of your brand equity, which of course is one of the most important things that companies have and possess. Now, um, for Stillmark, the way that traditional venture capital funds run is that you'll raise a fund and then that fund is deployed over the course of two to five years. And so each fund will sort of set their own terms and agreement with the fund's investors, the people that are capitalizing the fund. And then it's at the discretion of that fund's management team within a certain period of of, uh, the cadence with which they deploy capital. Now, one of the benefits, I think, of investing through a venture capital fund is that you get this really nice um, aspect of time diversification. So you're not investing just in a snapshot of the ecosystem, say, in 2022. But in our case, we started in uh, Fund One launched in 2019. 
So you would you would get a sort of range of activity from 2019, 2020, 2021 like this. And so we have this longer cycle and we'll continue to deploy regardless of macro conditions. Um, you know, Bitcoin has never, because people have been investors, traditional venture capitalists have been so distracted by, by DAOs, by DeFi, by NFTs. Bitcoin companies have never had these really hot valuations where the valuation, um, you know, exceeds what is justified based on the company's metrics. That's not the case for Bitcoin companies. And so that puts founders in a really excellent spot today in that they can justify the valuations they have. So you hear in the media a lot of talk around tech valuations are going to have to fall. Same thing for these altcoin, you know, Ethereum-based or Solana-based or whatever it is, um, valuations. Of course, those have to come down. They were never justified in the first place. And we're not in that same position. And so I think founders in, in wanting to raise rounds that were justified by the state of their business, founders happen to set themselves up really well to be able to tolerate and thrive um, in, a, in recession conditions. And of course, that goes back to what we said before about Bitcoin founders just being prepared for war at all times. It's not just that they have these long runways, not just that they're scenario planning, but also that they've been kind of the um, grown-ups at the table in terms of folks building um, in the broader cryptocurrency or um, blockchain protocol space. We're going to just stay the the course. So I don't expect there to be uh, you know any sort of significant change in terms of valuations. When Stillmark is investing, we always want to set the founders up and the common shareholders. So what that term means is founders or operators at a company that own equity in a company. We want to set them up for success. And so we're never uh, we. Um, we often lead the investments that we make, but not always. And we can either lead, we can co-lead, we can just be part of the syndicate. But when we lead, we're not offering a term sheet to sort of like out-compete or be flashy. We're offering what we think the fa- puts the founders and the common shareholders in the best position to optimize um, the returns that they make through what they build. And so that's not going to change um, based on the macro environment, other than that we might want founders to raise longer runways. And so whereas um, you know, in a typical state, we want founders to raise at least 18 months, and that's never a push for Bitcoin founders because they want to raise you know, two to three years or more runway. Um, But we would want to see founders raise at least 18 months. Now we would probably want to see something closer to 24 or 30 months um, if we were participating in a financing. That's the only change. It's it's probably not something that's any different than what founders themselves would want. And so I expect that over the next, um, the remainder of the year and the first half of next year that um, we'll be as active as we were in the first half of the year. And um, you know, we've we've been very active in the lightning space as well as um, backing companies that are helping financialize BTC, the asset. We'll continue to do that. This is like a, a port in the middle of a, a ocean storm. You got some stability in Bitcoin VC circles. That's good to hear. Everyone else I'm talking to is like head on fire, running out, trying to find capital for something, which leads me to a, a mining question if I can. I'm wondering after this market cycle where we saw all these mining firms go public, over 20 mining firms went public, how does the VC land or VC allocations for mining change going forward? That's a great question. So we, I think that um, we would like to have more mining companies in our portfolio. That's what I'd like. Um, Venture capital, of course, traditionally is focused on backing software companies. And so it's more difficult to fit mining companies into a traditionally structured venture firm. But yet still, when I I look at our portfolio, and you can find it on our website, um, I look at it and I feel like, you know, a gap that exists is exposure to the mining space, which is... You know, it's early, but it's relatively also mature in that we sort of know, um, we know a lot about mining. We know a lot more about mining than we do about other segments of the Bitcoin innovation ecosystem. And, um, you know, I'd like to be even more active there than we are. 
Our first mining investment, of course, is in the brilliant folks at Satoshi Energy. These are guys, um, Andrew Myers and Brock Peterson, coming from the energy space that really recognize Bitcoin as energy-backed money. And so, you know, what they're building, I think, both advances um, the mining field, but also advances um, the sustainable energy industry. And so it's been, you know, a pleasure and we've learned a lot through working with them. And I hope that they are the first of many investments we make in the mining space. That's a, it's an interesting point about the VCs allocating towards software because there, there have been some investments from VC circles into mining um, compasses backed by Galaxy and CoinShares among some other folk. Uh, and there's some other mining projects that are obviously just allocated from VC firms, but we've seen a lot of software teams also pop up in the mining space right now. Um, so I'm curious to see how the VCs move into mining during the bear market. Cause I do think a lot of miners are going to need some help. Just looking at like mm -hmm. the survey okay. of public information we have right now. Uh, there's a, just a, to pull a headline, there's a $4 billion number Bloomberg ran this morning about that's how much money public miners need to pay off uh, ASIC allocations. So I could see a lot of these firms needing money in the near future, but who knows? Um, that's, that's interesting to get your take on that though. Okay. Well, that's, um, I did not see that headline yet. So that sounds more like a private equity number or something that would be um, a match for a later stage venture capital firm. So maybe to just quickly describe a little bit about Stillmark for the sake of folks watching that aren't familiar. We fund one is focused on pre-seed, seed, and series A investments, but really the core of our work is around seed stage companies. Now, um, now, we also have a practice in doing growth stage investments, and that's done through separate vehicles. And so we have a breadth of work that we cover, of space that we cover. Um, but historically, what that's meant is from pre-seed, first check-in, through a mature Series B stage company. In the future, I think we'll go later stage than that. But that's where, you know, has sort of been our practice to date. Um, now, on the mining side, in addition to working with an early stage company like Satoshi Energy, I also have the privilege and benefit of having worked with Blockstream for quite a while and being a board member of Blockstream for the past several years. Um, and so we get to see and sort of work with folks operating across the whole spectrum um, of mining just between these couple companies. And I hope that that will make us great partners to new mining companies that come into our network, including and especially software companies, because we've been able to sort of, again, ride the peaks and troughs with these companies and um, get very familiar with, you know, the needs, the pain points and the opportunity space as well. Um, and so that's sort of my hope, you know, on, on Stillmark's side, what we want to do is keep pace with the innovation ecosystem. And so we want to match, um, match up really well with the needs of founders and operators. And you're pointing out later stage needs that sort of go past what we're focused on now. But I appreciate you pointing them out because we want to stay up to date and thoughtful about how we can partner with you know, uh, folks across the entire spectrum. Um, you know, the goal of the work, of course, is we're a traditional venture fund. So we want to be producing incredible returns and helping companies accelerate their growth, right? But if we all do our jobs well, both Stillmark and, you know, founders in the ecosystem and folks on their teams, if we all do our jobs well, then hopefully what that does is it, it um, you know, increases the fundamental value of Bitcoin. And what I mean by that is hopefully it drives adoption. Hopefully it expands the utility that people can get from um, Bitcoin the asset as well as Bitcoin the protocols. So we, we sort of have this approach of um, you know, being thoughtful about the impact of the way we work and the work that we do. And I think that you see that in founders too. I've talked a lot before about Bitcoin founders and, and team members being really mission-driven in a way that's quite, quite unique. Um, to entrepreneurship, it goes even beyond what we see in other spaces. And I think it's, you know, the regardless of the state of the market, both the macro environment and the crypto and Bitcoin market, regardless of that, the mission doesn't change. And we think about it, Stillmark team members think about it the same way. We still have 
a job to do that's important to both to our investors, to our founders, but culturally as well. Elise, that was perfect. That's a great place to, to leave the conversation. Thank you so much for joining the Compass Podcast. Really appreciate your insights. Uh, and like I said earlier, a port in the middle of the storm. There's so much going on right now. It's great to hear that Bitcoin VCs are still chugging away, taking on like the, the risk and the volatility and allowing people to continue to build. Wonderful. Thank you for having me.